Geburt Machnata Schweiz, the milk marketing board, as we would call it, have a milk factory, a big creamery at Pont Flanio, the bridge over the river Tyvee, a few miles south of Trigaran, where I stay. Now, it's my custom on opening day to pour a libation into the river I intend to fish. And on this occasion, I got hold of some of that famous Welsh cider they call scrumpo. And very, very bitter acid stuff it was, so much so that I thought we'd give the river a very generous libation indeed. I didn't covet it for myself on this wicked day. There really was a very bitter wind, and there was driving, lashing rain, and long before I began to fish even, a lot of this rain was penetrating, getting down my neck, soaking from my hair, and generally making me feel very cold and uncomfortable. And spring was very late in Cardiganshire this year. Everything seemed black. The thorn hedges were bare. But at least the water, so far at any rate, was fairly low and quite clear. Now it's this low, clear water that the fly fisherman wants on these very early rivers. If you get a lot of rain at this time of the year, these sort of rivers discolour very badly. They come up in brown flood, and this is quite hopeless for fly fishing. And on a hedge nearby, a sparrow hawk, very wet and looking the picture of dejection. Don't often see sparrow hawks about now. They become quite rare. And the sheep and lambs huddling under the lee of banks and hedgerows. Nobody about. The whole place deserted except for one mad Englishman who astonished even the hardy native sparrow hawk. When, at last, I managed to hook a fish, that was more than even he could stand. Well, I think I was very lucky indeed to get this fish on such a day. The river was getting up, it was discolouring, and for my part, having got that one, I was satisfied. And I made my way back to Pont Lanio because what I had in mind was to try and warm myself up with some tea. I thought, well, I'll knock off now while fortune has turned in my favour but I thought too soon. A Welsh thorn as big as a carpenter's nail had punctured one of my front tyres, and before I bothered about trying to change that wheel, I thought I must make a fire and get myself something warm inside me. Well, as a good infantryman, I like to think I can make a fire whatever the weather. Doesn't matter how wet it is, you can always find something dry in the lee of the trees, some driftwood, and some nice dry twigs enabled me to get a good fire going, and over the hot embers I cooked some Welsh cakes, those famous little delicacies to a very old recipe of my grandmother's. I brought my mother's old Welsh bakestone with me, especially for this very purpose. They really are very fragrant, and on a day like this, very warm. And it had been, I think, quite one of the worst days I've ever been fishing on. And by this time I was soaked right down to my linen. And very thankful I was to get there under the lee of that masonry and have something warm. I'd come quite a long way on this day, all the way up from Wiltshire. And of course, this wasn't the sort of weather I'd bargain for and look forward to for so long. Well, next day, as you can see, was a very different kettle of fish. It was bright and sunny, everybody clearing up the mess after all the floods of the day before. And even the hairy Welsh ponies were moved to roister about and enjoy the sunshine and the lark song. I'm afraid, though, that my forebodings about the river had indeed come to pass. The Tyvee was sliding down on this day in a real brown flood that made fly fishing absolutely out of the question. For the time being, all I could do was to bide my time and take in some of the pleasurable sights and sounds of this delightful Welsh countryside. Nowhere, I think, have I seen such hairy ponies as these in the Tyvee Valley. The Tyvee Valley in spring is a beautiful place and there's so much to see. The raven is very common here and at one time over a wood up on a hilltop, no less than 60 were indulging in the characteristic breeding season aerobatics. It's a wonderful thing to watch. Just see for yourselves now.
the raven breeds right the way down from the Arctic to Afghanistan, but in many parts of England they are not at all plentiful. They are fairly common here in central Wales, and as I say on this particular day, I counted as many as 60 in flight together. And the way they tumble in the air, almost as if they're completely out of control, is quite amazing. It's a thrilling thing to watch, something to delight a man and comfort him for the lack of his fishing. And all the time those strange croaks so characteristic of this great bird. A lot of the Welsh shepherds and hillside farmers use the horse to get about on on these steep mountain sides. And down by the thorn hedge where I'd taken shelter from the rather less bitter wind on this day, a tiny gold crest came foraging among the bare thorns, only a few feet away from me. And of course I got the most extraordinary glimpses of him. This is our tiniest bird, the smallest of all, nowhere near as big even as a wren. And by contrast, overhead, the majestic flight of a soaring buzzard. Seemed to be two pairs of buzzards in this part of the valley, and nearly always there was one or other overhead. They eat rabbits and small creatures and carrion. There's not much a buzzard won't eat. And one joins his mate now on a tree. I thought they were going to mate for a moment or two. They may just have been competing for space on that branch. Well, fishing in Tyvee was out of the question, but near the village of Llandewi Brewi, I found a tiny tributary flowing in. And this tributary stream was also marked on my map as part of the fishing of the Trigaran Angling Association. And so, starting above the boundary line, I began to fish the clear water. And there was a place where some concrete lined the bank, and the yellow hammers were singing their bread and cheese song in the thorns nearby. And from that little pool, I thought there was a very fair chance I might be able to connect with a trout. I had on, of course, my famous Imperial. It's a matter, really, of trying the likely places. The badge there of the Welsh Fly Fishing Association, which they very kindly gave to me after the game fair last year. And sure enough, before very long, I made contact with a very lively trout in this little stream which is called the Avon Piscotoyer. Avon Piscotoyer in the ancient tongue means simply the fisherman's river. And in this particular instance, it was a name which uh, was amply justified. Its trout were very, very pretty indeed, stippled with red, hardly any black spots, fish of about ten inches, very lively. And I was delighted too by the antics of a dipper, a bird which is a close relative of the wren. And it's astonishing how these birds choose to inhabit these very fast mountain streams. There is a reason for this actually, because the dipper who walks about on the bottom of these tumbling streams needs fairly fast water to enable him to keep his head well down and so to speak plain under the current and that enables him to forage for his food, the small fish and crustaceans and so on that he picks up among the stones and the pebbles. A little black and white dipper with a touch of chestnut at the bottom of his tummy. A delightful companion on a fishing day. And that, I think, was number three or number four, I forget which now. It was remarkable how the fish came on midway through this beautiful sunny afternoon, very, very much warmer than it had been on the previous day in that really bitter wind. And finally, there was an old footbridge with a bit of a pool before it. And it was there, I think, well on to about half past four in the afternoon that I finally caught my fifth fish of this unexpected and memorable outing. Pretty little fish of the Avon Piscotta, and I looked up to see the skylark in the sky and instead saw one of the inevitable buzzards sailing majestically overhead. A beautiful thing, the buzzard in flight. Well, I was well content with this little basket of five fish, 
looking up, noticed another buzzard and something odd about him. He had a forked tail and there was a good deal of red about his underparts. And that, of course, was no buzzard at all. That was the famous Welsh red kite, that rare bird, the sight of which made my day. When I arrived, I discovered that despite the rain, the fish had been moving very well indeed. And my old friend, Colonel Stanley Cole from Ibsley, had already managed to catch three very good fish, every one of them topside of three pound apiece. Rather slippery after all this heavy rain. Well, there wasn't any surface fly this day, so I set to to wire a hook, which I used to imitate the nymph, the nymph here of the sepia dove. This is a fly which appears in the month of April and is particularly common here at Two Lakes. My nymph, very simple, just a bear hook with a bit of wire on it to suggest a thorax and to sink the artificial beneath the surface. You could scarcely have a simpler fly than that. Only takes a moment to dress. Well, by the time I was ready to start fishing, there came a dramatic change in the weather. I say dramatic because the temperature dropped absolutely suddenly by no less than 18 degrees. And as you can see, quite a blizzard began to get up. It snowed quite steadily and it continued to do so all through the morning. Needless to say, this had an adverse effect on our sport. Most of the other rods gave it up. They were either satisfied with what they'd caught already and they went home, or else they sought shelter in their cars. I carried on fishing, and a fat lot of good it did me. However, um, I was anxious to try and break my duck if I could, and so I persevered. But I don't think I've ever fished for trout at any rate in worse snow conditions than these. And of course that drop in temperature didn't help matters. Also fishing not very far away and sticking it out manfully was Captain Peter Dean, the famous professional fly dresser from Eastbourne. And Captain Dean had already got one very good fish, well over four pounds. And at this stage he managed to latch into another. So I put my rod down and went along to watch him play it. And this too was a heavy fish. We were confident this one would go the top side of four pounds. Now, Captain Dean contracted polio during the war in India, and consequently he's obliged to do such fishing as he can tackle these days from his wheelchair. And considering that and with these dreadful conditions, I think you'll all agree that he deserves full marks for his performance. One or other of the anglers present will always stay with him to give him a hand so that they can help him to net out his fish. And this one was a monster, only an ounce or two under five pounds. That's a great start. He got a brace of fish there going something like nine pounds between them. And with that he said he was content and he wanted to go in and try and get dry before having his lunch. Providing he could dry out, I'd no doubt he would resume again later in the day. But obviously the man was in a good deal of discomfort because the snow had gone down his neck. That last fish took something like ten minutes to play. And the sooner he got in and got dry, the better. Later on, Alex Behrendt, who owns the fishery here, came out to feed the trout in his stew. These are long, narrow ponds which he and Catherine Behrendt constructed between them a few years ago. And it's in these that the young fish are brought on. And they are fed by a special type of pellet devised by Alex Behrendt. It's a great invention really because these pellets put red flesh on trout. This was the one thing that artificial feeding used not to do until Alex and some friends of his got down to the business of solving the problem. A red flesh trout is always so much more attractive on the table than one with pallid white flesh. Well, after lunch, I came out 
and carried on in slightly better weather conditions though these as it turned out were only to be temporary and I got off to a very good start in the afternoon. Colonel Crow came along to assist me with the landing net. The fish at this fishery do run very heavy indeed. Indeed, th this season so far there have been a great many fish caught up in the five, six and even seven pounds and over mark. Um, a friend of mine who was in my fishing class a couple of years ago had one of seven pound nine ounces a few weeks ago. Uh, Colonel Stanley Crow has had one well over six pounds already. And on the day I was there, even in these dreadful snow conditions, as you can see, we were catching fish of three and four pounds apiece. And there's the little bear hook that does the job so effectively and so simply. My catching fish of three and four pounds apiece. And there's the little bear hook that does the job so effectively and so simply. My wife came out to see my first fish. I may say by this time it was something like half past three in the afternoon. And as I'd been there since about half past ten in the morning, I'd been fairly patient, I think. The snow on the willow catkins made a very pretty picture, but you can scarcely call it a typical spring day. Far from it. It looked much more like the sort of weather when I go fly fishing for grayling in the month of January. And I was jolly glad of that battered old fishing hat of mine, however absurd it may look, and also of the mittens on my fingers. Mittens which I normally wear for grayling fishing in the dead of winter. The grayling, of course, often take very well during severe cold weather. This time of the year the grayling was spawning, and my quarry was trout, brown and rainbow. And my wife now gives me a hand to net out number two, and very capably she did the job too. Well, about this time the snow began to get bad again and I counselled her to go indoors and not to go and uh, get herself unduly wet and cold. I must stress this business of cold. You, you may not realise it, but the temperature at this time was a degree or two below freezing point. Colonel Stanley Crow gets his fourth on the far bank there. And he was present with me back in December when this lake was emptied in order to extend it with bulldozers and earth moving equipment during the winter months. As you can see the lake was fishing very well despite the weather and I was having a lot of trouble with my line icing up in the rod rings and having to stop every now and again to melt the ice with such warmth as remained in my fingers. It's scarcely conceivable that one should have to fish for trout in conditions like this in the south of England in the month of April. But there is the evidence you can see for yourselves. You can't really fish with gloves on, not fly fishing at any rate, but the mittens do help considerably. Considering that this lake was only emptied in December, it was fishing extremely well. And the reason is, of course, there is a very rich food supply in the waters of this fishery. And the fish thrive here. They put on weight very rapidly. The creatures on which they feed are of a great variety. Snail, shrimp, nymphs, and immense quantities of plankton, which of course you can see very clearly if you come here and take samples, especially during the summer months. Besides the fish which do so well here, a great many other wild creatures breed and thrive, not only in the lakes themselves, but also in the woods around the lakes. You'd scarcely expect to see things like butterflies and damselflies in these conditions, but in favourable conditions and at the appropriate time of the year, this is a great place for insects of many kinds, especially butterflies. Damselflies, dragonflies, frogs and toads breed here, and newts, there are grass snakes, and of course in the woods round about, a great many species of birds nest and thrive. 
Captain Dean, having dried out, warmed by his luncheon, resumes operations a few yards away from me, equally effectively. Actually, he knocked spots off me as far as the size of his fish were this day. I don't think he had one under about four pounds all the afternoon out of the five that he took. The big Alsatians here, which I must confess I'm rather afraid, are of course here to protect the fishery from the attentions of poachers and other uninvited guests. Some have tried in the past to get in and a very rough time of it they've had. Well, despite the weather, the fishing was absolutely superb. Many a time, even this season, I've been out on lovely fine and sunny days and failed to enjoy sport of a quality like this. I eventually got into quite a heavy fish and this one quite suddenly set off and he took something like 40 or 50 yards straight off my reel before I was able to check it. The fish here are very strong indeed, even at this early season. And they fight extremely well. I did promise when we came and made, uh, when we came and saw the lake being emptied in December that I would come back in the spring and report on how the lake was fishing. And I think it speaks for itself. I really hadn't expected to come here and catch enormous fish like that in quite such arctic conditions. By this time I think my hands were completely numb and I was jolly glad I got my limit. I drove over from Netherhaven on a blazing June day and my first port of call was at the keeper's cottage. The keeper on this particular length of the itching is a Netherhaven man, Len Bishop, and he's been here some years now and obviously gets the greatest pleasure out of his job. He's an extremely enthusiastic man, very, very keen about all aspects of his work on the river. Well, he took me forward to see Mrs. Bishop, whom I've met before when I've been fishing on this particular water, and she's extremely proud of the flowers in her garden. It's rather interesting to note that amongst all the cultivated flowers there, there were also some wild flowers, which are called at about this time, and the bees already busy, that lovely buzzing noise that you hear that tells you that summer has really come. They have some wildflowers growing in the garden because they happen to be fond of them, flowers like the campion here, which many people would probably dismiss as weeds. But what, after all, is a weed? If it has a beautiful flower, then it has its own merit. There, too, the lily of the valley was in bloom. This is one of my favorite flowers with its gorgeous scent. And the keeper showed me an ancient flybook that he'd come by. Obviously, uh, probably best part of a hundred years old because H.S. Uh, Hall invented the eyed fly during the last century and all these flies were obviously pre that date when they were the tippet of golden pheasant by the look of it. Now, on a hot day like this, you don't really expect very good fishing. A lot of... Uh, birds I noticed were very very tame on that lawn, the tamest of all being the thrush, and she had some young in the hedge nearby. As I was saying, on a blazing June day like that, you don't expect much fly, and consequently only in water of the very highest quality can you hope to enjoy dry fly fishing, because without the fly to bring them up, they're not likely to find to be many trout actually rising. Now, I think it's wonderful the way the swallows and the house martins long ago learned that you can't make bricks without straw. So they pick up the bits of straw and grass before they go to collect the damp mud. 
down by the river itself and from that they make their nests the martins under the eaves of houses and the swallows on the beams in the farm barns both species were very very busy on this particular morning as we made our way down to the bottom boundary just to take a look at the river at this point and to get the sniff and feel of it I wanted to see if there were any fish up on the fin yet of course at this time of the year there's a tremendous lot to see on the river and a lot of the river birds have their young just now among them the coot and the young coots have uh, little red heads quite unlike the bald white patch or the seemingly bald white patch of the parent birds the parent birds just now very very glossy black indeed and the white patch on the forehead standing out in sharp contrast always amusing to watch coots diving i think they don't seem to stay down very long they go down and collect bits of soft weed on which they feed the young and the first trout already on the fin as fly fishers say by that we mean sitting up high in the water watching for the first duns of the day to come down over them and when there are duns like that on the water there's a reasonable hope that trout will take both them and the artificial with which i simulate them my imperial that little dry fly which i nearly always use when i go dry fly fishing on a chalk stream anywhere and sure enough it didn't take very long to interest the first trout straight away i realized that this fish was a young fish a fish not yet at the standard at the point where we would consider him to be of takeable size a fish perhaps of about 14 ounces and be quite respectable on many waters but here considered of no account so i damped my hand carefully not to burn him gently release the fly and as soon as i possibly can quietly put the fish into the water head upstream and let him go probably very little the worse for the experience and about the damp water meadows on either side of the river the lapwings had their young three or four in most cases where they hadn't been taken by predators and of course the young lapwings a little bit perplexed and all the time the parent birds circling overhead calling to them warning them that there was somebody about and that they'd better keep still because that at this stage is probably their best defense that one i thought was a bit too inquisitive for his own good you have to be patient on a chalk stream especially on a hot day and you have to watch the beat very very carefully for the first signs of a rising fish you don't cast until you've actually seen the fish rise and break surface and you try and mark his position as exactly as you can approach him very carefully taking care not to get too close throw a fairly long line and try and put the fly a few inches in front of him float it gently over his nose and if you do this gently and accurately there's a good chance that he'll take sure enough this one was a better fish and as itching fish do he caught powerfully lashing about on the surface in a quite acrobatic sort of way this is a different for behavior from that of some other chalk stream fish who tend to dive down into the weed when they are hooked these itching fish are gentlemanly fighters and they nearly always fight it out on the surface laying down there same color in many respects as the buttercups and every bit as beautiful the flies hatching these days were blue winged olives this is probably the commonest of all our river flies and these flies take shelter in the bankside herbage and there they are sought by amongst other birds the young gray wagtails which i noticed all the way along the river the gray wagtail with the beautiful lemon colored breast a bird which many people mistakenly call the yellow wagtail the yellow wagtail is a quite different bird a summer migrant and yellow all over pretty well a lot of these birds take these blue and olive duns as they shelter in the herbage before undergoing the final transformation which will take them to their adult and mating stage it's a delicate pastime dry fly fishing extremely exacting it's 
especially in these conditions, you dare not make any mistakes at all, otherwise your fish is gone before you can ever drop the fly over his nose. But what rewarding fish these itching fish are to catch. The first one I kept was a pound two ounces, and the second almost its direct twin, deep and thick and as fat as butter. Perhaps the most characteristic bird on this whole stretch was a bird at first sight just like a house sparrow, but with what looked like a clerical collar around his neck. And this is the little bird sometimes called the reed sparrow, the reed bunting. The bird I call typical of this beautiful stretch of the itchy. Well into the afternoon, I managed to hook my best fish of the day. He was a bit of a teaser because he was lying tight under some overhanging grasses, right under the far bank. This is very often the sort of place that a good trout chooses to lie, and he takes just a little bit of care to make the fly come down without fouling the grasses so that the fish is able to take it. And, of course, it had been very warm work under the hot sun. And now, late in the afternoon, the fly had ceased to hatch, and fish had ceased to move. It was clear to me, indeed, that that was probably the end of sport for the day. And as I never fish in the evening myself, it was time to go home. A glimpse of an eel under the bank as I made my way back down the beat to the hut where the keeper, Len Bishop, was awaiting my return. And I was extremely glad to see him because when he emerged from the hut, I noticed he was carrying a bottle of cool ale and there was nothing I fancied more after my labour in the sunshine. So, in exchange for this, very comforting pot I handed over to keep a limb bishop the fruits of my own toil and he for his part laid them out on the grass so that he could appraise the fish I had taken this day three booties between a pound two and a pound six ounces Les Sawyer, head river keeper on the water we'd been invited to fish, just had time to show us to our beats, and then he had to dash off to hospital to see his wife, who just presented him with a baby. Dr. Ramo fishing with his famous automatic fly reel. No ratchet there, no handle, and fishing the dry fly, floating his artificial down over the grayling lies. And a nice contrast in casting style farther upstream where Cannon Finch has already commenced operations. The Cannon is usually accompanied on a fishing expedition by his little Dachshund Pippa, and she can never resist trying to catch the water voles that are bound on this part of the Avon. Never seems to have very much success, but obviously enjoys trying. Well, Dr. Jones couldn't join us until after his morning surgery, and uh, we were planning to fish on until about half past twelve and then join him for a picnic lunch. And I very much hope that Dr. Rammel might open his account with a grayling before it came time to leave the river. Unfortunately, there weren't many flies about and the start was rather slow. After a bit, however, the first duns began to come down on the water and Rammel got a take far across under the trees and opened his account with his first grayling in this autumn season. He himself normally goes down to the Jura in the south of France to fish for grayling at this time. They rate grayling very highly in France. Rameau was accordingly very pleased to come in to lunch with a fish already in the bag, so to speak. Well, he hadn't seen Dr. Jones and, uh, since he, Rameau, was over here in May last year, and they are old friends, often have a day out together when Rameau stays with me in England. Cannon is great. A drinker of hot soup on these picnic occasions, and Dr. Jones had brought along some of his traditional homemade wine, a brew he makes, I'm told, from black currants, and very good it is. Even Rameau 
who is something of a connoisseur in these matters, thoroughly approves of Dr. Jones's vintages. And Canon Finch, too, has a very good eye for it. And after lunch, Rammel presented me with a box of the most exquisitely dressed artificial flies that I think I've ever seen. Even the veins in the wings were most faithfully represented. Dressed specially, I was told, by Dr. Juge in France. Well, all I could offer Ramo in return was the entire contents of my own modest fly box uh, to wit, one bear hook with a bit of wire on it to make it sink. That's what I'm using to catch my grayling with at this time of the year. Very effective it can be, and Ramo adds it to his 250 other nymph patterns. Well, after lunch, we were all able to go back to the fishing except for Canon Finch. He had to return to the church at Netherhaven where uh, Jennifer Kent and Joel Sims were to be married in the middle of the afternoon. And the canon, we hoped, would be able to rejoin us later on. Rammel, a veritable latter-day Clemenceau, sets about the grayling for all the world like a tiger as he stalks. And if a grayling takes him, he doesn't stand very much chance of getting away. Rammel never uses a net, always catches the fish up with his hand. And farther up the river now, Dr. Jones gets off the mark. The doctor, in fact, went on to catch the best bag of the day, although he had a rather late start. Rammel caught the most fish on the dry fly. And now, at Netherhaven, the wedding proceedings are just coming to an end, all except for the confetti throwing and so on. And the canon congratulates Giles and Jennifer Sims. Pause now for the photograph to be taken. And the canon, no doubt, will shortly be turning his mind once more to the grayling in the river. And the little dog, Pippa, anxious for him to come back and make a start. And for her to get back to the waterfalls. Lovely old church nether even. colourful place it is just now with the leaves all turning. The doctor, as I said, went on to make the best basket of the day, but Rammel acquitted himself very well too, and Canon Finch, when he returned to the river, went on to catch the heaviest grailing of the afternoon. So we all had something to feel very pleased about, and that's how it should be during a grailing festival. Head Channel, the cameraman, joined me at the close of the afternoon when I myself knocked off four grayling in my last five casts, and Ted was there to record the last two. The last one of all, he managed to film in reflection as the grayling took. Well, of course, Selborne has changed, as villages everywhere have changed and are changing under the pressures of expansion and development. But the Wakes, the house where Gilbert White lived for so many years, has probably changed relatively little since his time. And I feel sure that if he were to take a walk around the village of Selborne today, he'd find a great deal that was completely familiar to him. The smell of this last week of October is one typical example. And he would notice the riven ash. He wrote of these trees, when young and flexible, they were severed and held open by wedges while ruptured children, stripped naked, were pushed through the apertures under a persuasion that by such a process the poor babes would be cured of their infirmity. 
we have several persons now living in the village who in their childhood were supposed to be healed by this superstitious ceremony. Well, that particular ash, I would imagine, was struck by lightning. The smells of autumn, the tints on the trees, the last of the summer flowers, all these things Gilbert White would find familiar the colours in the trees which he'd see from this hill at the back of the church. And on the hedgerows now, there are all the bright berries of this season. Among them, the last of the blackberries. They used to say that the devil touches the blackberries on Michaelmas Day, and it's not good to eat them after that date, the 29th of September. But in fact, a few days ago, the blackberries there on the Selborne hedges were as sweet and as juicy as any that I've tasted this summer. Gilbert White wrote of the steep lanes there that they deserve our attention, but they look more like watercourses than roads and are bedded with naked rag for furlongs together. In many places they are reduced 16 or 18 feet beneath the level of the fields and after floods and in frosts exhibit very grotesque and wild appearances from the tangled roots that are twisted among the strata and from the torrents rushing down their broken sides and especially when those cascades are frozen into icicles hanging in all the fanciful shapes of frost work these rugged gloomy scenes affright the ladies when they peep down into them from the paths above and they make timid horsemen shudder when they ride among them, but delight the naturalist with their various botany. And those lanes are as attractive and as strange today as they were in Gilbert White's time. He said of the country round about Selborne that it was rich in game and that partridges and pheasants abound. Now, there's a, an open patch of ground by the church called the Plestor, and in White's time, a shrew ash used to stand here, an ash in which a shrew had been entombed alive, and the branches were applied to sick cattle to heal them. Well, it seems the vicar of the day wasn't at all pleased with this barbarous practice, and he had the shrew ash destroyed. White wrote, The evening proceedings and manoeuvres of the rooks are curious and amusing in the autumn. Just before dusk, they return in long strings from the foraging of the day and rendezvous by thousands over Selborne Down, where they wheel round in the air and sport and dive in a playful manner, all the while exerting their voices and making a loud coin, which, being blended and softened by the distance that we in the village are below them, becomes a confused noise of chiding, or rather a pleasing murmur, very engaging to the imagination and not unlike the cry of a pack of hounds in hollow echoing woods, or the rushing of the wind in tall trees, or the tumbling of the tide upon a pebbly shore. We remember a little girl who, as she was going to bed, used to remark on such an occurrence in the true spirit of physical theology that the rooks were saying their prayers. A very pretty story, that one. The present-day vicarage dates back to Victorian times and around this particular part close to the church there have probably been many changes since Gilbert White's day. Even in the churchyard itself he would have found the great horse chestnut unfamiliar because these trees were only introduced into England from Macedonia in the early 1800s. But not very far away from the chestnut is a great yew tree and this tree has probably changed little since Gilbert White's day. It's claimed to be one of the very oldest in all England. It is, I think, much the most massive yew tree that I've ever seen anywhere and it stands only a few yards away from the main entrance to the church. Around behind the church itself I found Gilbert White's grave simple inscription there, just his initials and the year of his death.
There's been a nest of wood ants at Cramp Moor near Rumsey in Hampshire for at least a century past. The late Harry King, who lived in Cramp Moor village, was told about this nest as a boy, by the old gamekeepers in the district, and they themselves could remember the nest when they were lads. So we know this is a nest of some considerable antiquity. It's a high nest, several feet above the ground, constructed of pine needles and small twigs, and although there's no cementing used in the construction, it's quite a rigid structure, full of chambers and tunnels, all interconnecting. And this is the home of the wood ant, the largest of all our ants. It's also called the horse ant because of its size, and in some places they call them hill ants because of this habit of building mound-like nests. Now, there's scarcely any part of the wood to which the ants do not penetrate. They're busy creatures. The ones we're uh, looking at here are workers. The true males and females are winged insects which emerge at about this time of the year and they mate on the wing. Females come down to the ground, shed their wings and then set about the business of establishing new colonies. The great majority of the ants in the nest are workers, perhaps a little smaller, but they're above a quarter of an inch in size. Most of them there is a smaller worker which we shan't be seeing today. And they range about into these trees, reaching every twig and leaf. And if you shake a tree in a wood where these ants live, then showers of wood ants are likely to fall out of it. And take care you don't get them down your neck, because they secrete a pretty formidable quantity of formic acid. And this they eject when they come up against something or somebody they don't like. And apart from that, of course, they have the most formidable jaws. And all the ants out of the nest recognize one another with a sort of touch of recognition. And then they pass on about their business. Quite a lot of them range about into the Christmas trees growing here on this estate, looking for the aphids which uh, are on the trees. These aphids secrete a very sweet substance called honeydew. And the ants lick them, milk them in a sense. You can call them pastoralists. Now, a friend of mine was telling me only the other day that he climbed a tree to watch some badgers. And just on dusk, as the badgers were coming out, he suddenly realized he was covered in wood ants. And so he gave up his chance of watching badgers that evening and came down pretty rapidly to get rid of the ants. I myself, when I'm walking about near this nest, like to wear Wellington boots as protection from for my legs. The ants have for generations used the same paths, and these are quite clearly to be seen in the wood, even on a day when there are no ants about. On a sunny day is the best time to see them, because then the ants come out in great numbers and forage around for food. And they've obviously caught one of Alex Bairant's uh, bees unawares. This is on Alex Bairant's land, my old friend, who has the fishing lakes near Romsey. Now, to protect these bees, in the hive, Alex has to take other precautions. Uh, he stands the hives on small platforms, and each of the platform legs stands in a can of petrol, and that prevents the ants getting into the hive, because these wood ants are formidable creatures, they wouldn't hesitate to attack bees. They attack a great many creatures of different kinds, got hold by the look of it of a big beetle larva here. And this creature is inevitably destined to end up as food for the colony. It's remarkable how if a creature is too big for one ant to manage, the others immediately come to uh, its aid. These are social insects closely related to the bees and the wasps. And when a, a worker gets hold of a creature it can manage by itself, it points it straight forward in front of it and heads straight back for the nest. This curious habit of carrying the prey pointing forwards. You would have thought it would be easier to tow it behind. Some creatures, oddly enough, are able to cross the ant track with impunity. And one such we saw on this particular day was a big, large and very slimy slug. And it was quite evident the ants would have no truck with this creature at all. I shouldn't think 
That was a very comfortable passage for the slug for all that. Of course, the ants don't get it all their own way. When they fall on the water of the lakes, the fish take them quite freely. Now, he thought it might be rather amusing to try and dress an artificial ant using thick black thread to build up the body, a nice black hackle coming somewhere in between the two thickish parts of the uh, artificial's body, and then take it down and have a go and see if I could catch one of these fish. When fish are swimming on ants, they swim very close to the surface and you can get some pretty clear idea of where to drop your artificial. Well, now, let's see how we fared. My method of attracting a trout's attention to my artificial ant is to just give it a little bit of animation, just draw it along the surface a foot at a time. There's the little movement, and that very often will attract a trout and cause him to take with quite a, a slashing rise. And one such has now obliged on the second part of the afternoon. Good fish this, putting up a stubborn fight, as they always do here at Two Lakes. They've had some wonderful fish there this season, the best one going close on six pounds. I myself have had trout here well over four pounds this year already. This one, not quite in that category, but look, looks as if it's nearer three pounds than two. Be a good fish anywhere else, here at Two Lakes, considered something very ordinary indeed, and not particularly flattering to butch the dog, that big Alsatian of Alex's, who lives, as far as I can gather, on dog biscuits and poachers. The first willow leaves are already falling and come sailing down like long ships out of the north. And there's a chill in the early morning and the dew is heavy. It'll be some time yet before they'll be fly on the water and before trout will be rising. Only when the sun has dried the webs do the spiders themselves appear. And then a few flies appear on the water as well. The trout begin to rise and it's time we had a go at them. And today I'm fishing with the dry fly with my imperial, a pattern I devised way back in 1962. And whenever small flies we call duns, whatever the species, are on the water, virtually invariably the trout will take this fly, if, of course, it's properly presented to them. And my first fish of the day is a good one, a fish of about two ounces over the pound. And only a few yards higher up, another one was rising. So as soon as I could, I got cracking. I had to be careful because of the... The tall trees just behind me, they didn't give me a lot of scope. I was just able to reach that fish, but almost immediately he weeded me. When you hook a trout, sometimes you fight on the top of the water, but at other times you burrow down into the thick ranunculus, the water buttercup. And if he does get fast in there, with perhaps the weed gripped, no doubt accidentally, between his teeth, then he's very difficult to dislodge. Now, it was a good fish, and I didn't want to risk breaking. And so, after trying to handline the fish out without success, I decided the only thing to do was to go in and try and persuade him to kick free so that I could net him. Well, this is exactly what he did. He kicked free into the open channel beyond, causing no inconvenience to the little grey wagtail on the adjoining weed raft. And already I was having difficulty in getting to net the fish because he'd come out but was covered in a certain amount of weed. Eventually, however, I got the net under him and there he was, nice and safe. A fish almost identical in size with the first one, about an ounce over the pound. And this may explain to my wife, if she's watching, why it is I come home sometimes soaked to the waist. Because I'm afraid both my boots got absolutely filled with cold river water in that simple process. A late chiff chaff in the willows alongside. I dare say he'll be leaving us soon. My first job, get rid of that water. 
And now, at lunchtime, I was joined by my good friend and doctor, Dr. Dick Jones from Durrington, who often has a day with me to close the trout season. And he'd brought with him a wonderful hot curry cooked by his wife, Betty, who makes as good a curry as anybody I know this side of Bombay. And with it, many delightful things, coconut, onion salad, mango chutney, and those lovely crunchy Indian poppadums. And to coax this down, for as you well know, we are men of indifferent appetite, some of the doctor's raspberry wine. And what a beautiful colour this was. Now, this is his secret recipe. Please don't write and ask me for it. I don't know it myself. Lovely stuff to look at, and in a moment or two, I dare say, wonderful stuff to drink. One for the doctor, one for me, and of course, one for Ted Channel, the cameraman. Otherwise, we shan't get any work out of him later on this afternoon. Dear old doctor, dear old Ted. Well, the grey wagtail is one of those creatures who've been with us ever since May Day, when the trout season opens in Wiltshire, and one of the birds we shall miss. A lot of other creatures about the waterside we are also accustomed to seeing on a day's fishing. And this, I think, must be the furthest young water vole in the entire Upper Avon Valley. Well, lunch being over, and both of us suitably fortified with hot curry and raspberry wine, we decided to get on with the fishing. You see, the doctor can't come out first thing in the morning because he has his morning surgery to attend to. And that is why, uh, on alternate Saturdays, he'll generally join me at the river around about lunchtime. And already he spotted a fish rising way up on the reach above. I, meanwhile, had gone down below to try my luck where the coots were busy among the bulrushes. Bulrushes, which some people prefer to call great reed mace. And already the doctor into his first fish of the day. There was a very good hatch of fly on this particular afternoon. You often find this at the very end of the season. And of course the fish themselves tend to rise with some freedom at this time of the year because they are feeding up hard with spawning time now only a couple of months ahead. That's not the raspberry wine, this is just artistic camera work. Uh, the trout feeding up hard and some of the bigger fish moving. You see the big trout moving round about mayfly time and then very often they're not much in evidence during the summer months but it's quite usual for them to reappear uh, towards the very end of the season. Indeed, I was out grailing fishing on Saturday, which is the first day after the trout season had ended, and I caught, I think, one of my biggest brown trout of the season, and he, of course, had to go back. Now the doctor has taken a very fine grailing of about a pound and a half, and the coots playing up. There are a lot of very noisy coots on this reach. I think they were a little jumpy because earlier in the day there had been some duck shooting. And understandably, the coots weren't too sure of our intentions. Another fish for me, lower down, this I think was my number five and giving me quite a lot of difficulty. I was trying to stop this one from weeding me, still quite a lot of weed in the river. And opposite, some linnets were bathing, ignoring me and my struggle with the trout. More companions of ours at the waterside. And that was my number five. What a wonderful day for us to end our season with. And I'll say goodbye.